Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. I'm going to try to talk about Daniel uh, for the rest of however long we have here. Amen. So we're in Daniel chapter 11. We only got one more chapter left after this one. And uh, can, yes, sir. Let me go ahead and switch over here. Um, and some of this that we're going to talk about tonight, some of it you've already heard me say, but again, I was purposefully mentioning some of these things on more than one occasion so that your heart and your mind would be prepared for it whenever it came forth. So that it wasn't just the first time you ever heard some of these people's names um, and that you would be somewhat familiar with their names by the time that we got here. So let's just go ahead and read uh, a couple of verses. We'll read uh, verses 1 and 2 of Daniel chapter 11 and then we'll talk about We'll go to Daniel 8 after that. He says, also I in the first year of Darius the Mede. Now, before we move forward, I want you to know that this is a continuation from chapter 10. In, in chapter 10, the angel was speaking. It didn't say specifically that it was Gabriel. Most scholars believe it was Gabriel, but we're not really told that with certainty. But nevertheless, I just want you to know that the angel is still speaking and he's speaking to Daniel and he's giving Daniel this revelation of things that were yet to come. And he says, also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. So one of the things that I want you to notice right off the bat is, is that this angel that's giving this message to Daniel is also saying that he came and he strengthened Darius the Mede. Now what I want you to know about that is that Darius the Mede was not a... Israelite. He wasn't a Hebrew. He was a Gentile king. He was a king of, per of the Medo-Persian Empire. And I just find it very interesting. We're, we're about to talk about a little bit of history here in a moment, but I want you to think about that. If it serves God's purpose, he will give strength to whom he wills. If it's God's purpose that a Gentile king be risen to power because he has a greater purpose that he plans to accomplish through that, then that's what God will do. I want you to imagine in your mind, and I don't know if this is a good analogy or not, but I want you to imagine in your mind a chessboard. And there's, there's pieces on the chessboard and they're being moved around. I need you to understand that God is the hand that moves the pieces on the chessboard. And that many times, one of the things that I, I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, but I want to say it again because I was thinking about it heavily today, that whenever I grew up in school, I, I didn't pay attention very well in school. I kind of just winged it. But I do remember some things now that the Lord has reawakened my mind and my heart. I remember specific things that I was actually being taught when I was in school. Whether it was through social studies or world history or Western civilizations. I remember some of these classes that I took. And I remember some of the things that they spoke about, about certain instances and people and kingdoms and the rise of power and the fall of power. But never once do I remember hearing about the country Israel. Never once do I remember hearing about the nation of Israel. And yet when I read the Bible time and again and try to teach to you the Bible, because every time I teach to you and go back to the beginning and start from scratch, I learn the Bible even better. And I'll never stop teaching that way on Wednesday nights. I'll continue to go. Once I'm getting done with Revelation, I'm going back to First Chronicles. I'm going through the end of it. The, and then we're going to eventually we'll go back to Genesis. And I'll continue to do that till I don't, till the Lord tells me that I got to quit, retire from preaching, which I hope he never does. Or, you know, I don't know, something. Jesus but comes back. Yeah, or Jesus comes back. Because I love teaching the word of God. Amen. And I learn every time I teach. So. But when I read the Bible time and again, and I study the Bible in detail, what I find and what I learn is, and especially in this, the movement of history on the earth. While they didn't talk about Israel, while they never talked about King David, while they never talked about King Solomon or any of those things. Whenever I read these passages of scripture, I realize all of those things that they were teaching me about in school were actually taking place according to the Bible story because God was making those things take place because it had something to do with his people at that moment in time, but also he was setting the stage for the days that would come. Now, I want you to think about that. If you learned about Alexander the Great or the Grecian Empire, you learned about Cleopatra. You remember, who doesn't know Cleopatra? Come on, raise your hand if you never heard of Cleopatra. That's what I thought. 
You know, you, you heard of Cleopatra. She actually, her life exists within the verses of these scriptures that we're going to read. She was part of this timeline in history of Daniel chapter 11. Now, her name's not in there, but her little life and period of time existed within the movements and the operation of this time frame. And yet, we've never heard of King David. We've never heard of Solomon. We've never heard of the prophet Daniel in public school. And with, with, But again, when we read it, we see that the reason that all these things were happening was because God was moving pieces on a chessboard. I believe that. It's easy for me to believe that. I believe that the hand of God is sovereign and that God is moving in the lives of humanity and that God is orchestrating events upon this earth and that he will bring it through to the end exactly the way he wrote it. Now, sometimes we may not completely understand what he wrote. And that's why we have to dig and we have to keep on dissecting and we got to keep on going and, 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 and keep on trying to learn. Because I don't know about you, but I want to know his word. The best that I can. And I understand that to some extent I'm a human being and I'm a finite being and, and that his ways are above my ways and his, and his, and his thoughts are above my thoughts. And, and that he is to some extent at some point in time beyond my comprehension. But I'm sure you're not going to fault me for not trying. So this angel see, it says to Daniel that he went to go strengthen Darius the Medo king. Because at that point in time, that was God's purpose. Amen? And he says, and now I will show you the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. Now, I need you to understand that when Daniel's saying this, again, these events that are about to start taking place had not happened yet. Okay, this angel is speaking to Daniel about things that are going to unfold in the near future, but also when we get towards the end of the chapter, in the distant future. Okay, and one of the things that, this is another little history lesson that I find interesting. When you study and you dig a little bit deeper, you realize that this, this, king, this fourth Persian king is actually Xerxes, or also known as Ahasuerus, which is the Persian king in the book of Esther. Okay, and so we see these kings and these stories, and to me, those things are interesting because the more that I understand that, the better I understand the Bible. Anybody read the book of Esther yet? Y'all know the story of Esther, amen, and, and how she married that Persian king and how God used her mightily, amen, to save the Jewish people. All right, let's go backwards real quick and let's refresh ourselves because ultimately, again, we're going to be getting into... Uh, information that's connected to the Antichrist. <laughs> and I don't know, I mean, some people might would say, by now they may say, dude, why do you keep talking about the Antichrist so much? I mean, isn't this enough? Well, I'm not the one talking about it. Daniel is, number one. And number two, I gotta be honest with you. The, my interpretation of when the rapture takes place now, what I believe, I feel, I feel relatively strongly that there's the possibility that the, that the church will see him. Now, you may not, again, I'm, be careful, but you may not agree with that. And in the end, it's okay. I've already made that point. You don't have to agree with me. But because I truly believe that, what, what kind of a pastor or preacher, for that matter, would I be if I did not try to prepare you to help you to see what he may look like and what we can expect? I don't think that I would be a very good one. So that's why I continue to talk about these things. All right, so now we're in Daniel chapter 8, and some of this talks about we get to the Antichrist, but it also mentions this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, all right? And we're going to talk about him more because he's in chapter 11. So then it says, Then I lifted up my eyes, and I saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns. We've already studied this, but this ram that had two horns, one horn was higher than the other. This was representative of the Medo-Persian Empire. There was an alliance between two nations, the Medes and the Persians. First, the Medes were more powerful, and the Persians later gained the power. He said he had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher came up last. Persia came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward. Now... In the passage that we just read before we went to chapter 8 and chapter 11, it talked about four Persian kings. And that the last one would be the strongest. 
and that he would go fight against Greece. And that's the one connected or that at least is spoken about in the book of Esther. He was the strongest of all the Persian kings and he moved forward towards the west. He crossed the river, the Hellespont River, and he attacked Greece. That was the initiating factor that would later cause Alexander the Great to retaliate against the Persian Empire. Alexander the Great was groomed in the art of war for that one purpose. And that was what he was motivated by was to get control over Persia and to retaliate against what they had done to his to his nation. So this Persian king pushes westward because Greece is west of Persia and northward and southward so that no beasts might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and he became great. And as I was considering, behold, a he goat from the west. That's Alexander the Great. A he goat from. Now, I got to remind you that all this is happening hundreds of years after Daniel prophesies these things, after Daniel gets visions of these things. He never saw Alexander the Great. But it was written in the book of Daniel. Okay? He came from the west on the face of the whole earth and he touched not the ground. That's descriptive of. Just sheer rapidity, rapidly, the, 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 the armies of Alexander the Great swarmed the land and it just destroyed everything that was before. And, and, the, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with cold or a great anger against him, and he smote the ram, and he broke his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground, and he stamped on him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore, the goat waxed very great. The Grecian Empire, Alexander the Great, became very powerful. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. As fast as he became in power, he also died. He died two years later. The story goes that he died, it's written in history. The story goes, and I mean, this is my best assumption, and I can tell you what probably happened. The only thing that we know is, is that a night after a, like, I guess a revel, a drunken revelry, maybe they won, they won, I don't know, and they, they all got drunk, and Alexander the Great got drunk. And the next morning, the next day, he had a bad fever. And within two days after that, he died. Now, I can tell you probably what happened. He got drunk. He aspirated vomit in his sleep. The vomit went into his right lung. He got an aspiration pneumonia. And he died two days later. Because let me just tell you, aspiration pneumonia will get you sick so fast. And you will start running fever so fast. I've caught one person that had it when I was in nurse practitioner school. And I'm telling you right now, it happened within a day. And that dude was already running 103 degree fever and his whole right lung was whited out. And, and anyway, long story short, that's, I believe, what happened to Alexander the Great. But before I lose my train of thought with all of that, how amazing is that? That God would allow all of these situations to take place. God would allow this angel to go over here and to strengthen this, this Persian king Darius, but later on a fourth king would come, would rise up and he would attack Greece because it was God's will that it happened. And then in the wings, this young teenage boy is being trained for the art of war. And then he zooms across and he takes over. And then two days, two years later, he dies. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is this, is that we think that we can plan things out, but the word of God says, you're not promised tomorrow. Today, there's multitudes in the valley of decision. Today is the day of salvation. You're not, you and I are not promised tomorrow. God holds this world in his hand. Amen. And it's his will that's going to be done. And so he, when he was strong, the great horn was broken and for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. Again, these four when Alexander died, his kingdom was split between four generals. Out of one of them came forth a little horn. That's who we're going to be talking about tonight. His name was Antiochus Epiph Epiphanes, which waxed exceedingly, exceedingly great towards the south, toward the east, toward the pleasant land, which is Israel. All right, let's go back to Daniel chapter 11. I just wanted to, to you know, reiterate 
things having to do with Antiochus Epiphanes, all right, and, and how he's a type of the Antichrist. So he goes on to say in uh, verses 2 through 4, that the, what we already read that about that fourth king getting strong and he and look what it says he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia and a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will and when he shall stand up this is God Alexander the Great again this is in chapter 11 so in chapter 8 it mentions him but in chapter 11 it mentions him he shall stand up his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided towards the four winds so in chapter 8 it was four horns here it's, it's four winds and not to his posterity. Now, now check this out. Now, and we're not going to read this whole chapter because it just goes back and forth and it's got great detail. And I love it. It's full of history and it, it stimulates me to study, but I'm not going to do that to you. But I want you to know you can go through almost every verse and you can back it up according to history. And so what it's saying right here is this, not to his posterity. In other words, when he died, his kingdom was split in four, but it wasn't amongst his four sons. What ended up happening was it was it went to the four generals because they say that on his deathbed, they said, you're you're sick, my Lord, or whatever they told him. Who shall reign? He said, let the strong have. And so there, there you go. It got split up into four. Nor according to his dominion, which he ruled for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. And so. I want you. I want one of the things that I wanted that I also wanted you to know, and I've mentioned it before, that liberal scholars, and I've tried to kind of like warn people that come to the church. Not you watch what you want to watch on TV. I'll never be a control, a person that that's controlling. But I just got to warn you and let you know if you watch the History Channel and you watch those people that call themselves Bible scholars on there, you need to understand that liberal scholars, they liberal scholars. They scoff at people like you and me that believe that the Bible is the word of God. All right. And they, they would, they, I'm sh quite sure they sip their wine and smoke their pipes in their back rooms and they laugh at people like us, but I don't want to laugh at anybody, but it's kind of comical that they would spend their whole life and get a PhD in a, in a degree that they don't even believe. Okay, so they, they do all of that. They get a doctorate, a doctorate degree. They got to write a dissertation on a subject that they don't even really believe is truly the word of God. All right. Well, what they say is, is that there's no way that Daniel could have prophesied or predicted or that there's no, they don't believe in the supernatural. So there's no way an angel could have told Daniel these things. So what they say is, is that it was written later, like say, 100 AD, 150 AD. Now, this what I'm about to tell you about does not prove the point either way, but I find it interesting. Has anybody ever heard of Josephus before? Yeah. The Jewish historian? Josephus was a Jewish historian uh, about 15 years after Rome destroyed Jerusalem. In about AD 95 is when he wrote his book, The Antiquities of the Jews. So he was a Jewish historian, and his name was Flavius Josephus. He published his work in about A.D. 93 or 94. Josephus mentions a meeting between Alexander and the high priest of the time. Alexander was on his way to Jerusalem. He was going to ransack the city. And when he saw this high priest, according to Josephus' testimony, again, this is just a one man's testimony. We can't call him to the stand and ask him. I'm just telling you what he said. He says that according to, according to his testimony, that what was written and what was known in the, is that whenever Alexander saw the high priest, he said, you're the one that I saw three years ago in a dream. Your face is the one that I saw three years ago in a dream that told me to get up and to go conquer Persia. All right. And so that was that was one of the things that that was that was, you know, the point that I wanted to make. Again, it doesn't prove that he was uh, that. You know that that the writings didn't come later i i don't need to be convinced because i know that god is more than capable to send an angel to give a message god is more than capable to give a prophet a word to speak forth the truths but what i'm but what i need you to know is when we're talking about how meticulous these things came to pass in history i don't i don't think i'm doing it injustice i feel like i'm putting y'all to sleep I really do. I feel like y'all are going to sleep on me. I mean, it's probably because you've been working hard. I know, I know, I, 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 but I just want you to know if you really stopped and you read this and you realize how specifically all of these things came to pass, 
then it should show you the wonder and the glory of your God. Is, what I'm, is really what I'm trying to get across. To. It should show you the wonder and the glory of your God. But again, we, we got to dig in order, in order to find these things, right? And so for the next, from, from verses 5 through 13, it really, the, the, the verses focus on the ongoing battles. So I, what I wanted you to see, I drew a little map so that we could maybe kind of like look at it a little bit here, if I can find it. Here we, no, that's not it. All right, here we go. Cool. A little map. Can you see that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I'm going to just show you again, I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to use green. I'm going to use white so you can see it. These are the, these are the, uh, these are the places where these four generals were. This is over here in Greece. You see that? No. In red. You see that in red over there? That little white I just drew, mm -hmm. the arrow, that's Greece. That was his dad. His dad was Philip of Macedon. Over here in Asia Minor was one. But these are the two that I want to focus on, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. You see down here in Egypt, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. These are well known in history. Um, these were where the four generals came from. But these two right here are the ones that in verses 5 through 13, when you read it, it's a going back and forth, okay? There was like nine Seleucids and like six different Ptolemies. So it was a, it was a reign in, in, this, in this time frame of these, of these leaders. One would die, another would rise up. One would die, another would rise up. And they were fighting one another. They were fighting for control of this whole area. If you look over here, I, I, have, I have Israel over here, right? I got, this is Babylon. They, they controlled the Seleucids, which is where Antiochus Epiphanes comes from. The Seleucids and really up here in Syria. Okay, I thought that was interesting because we were just talking about the Assyrian versus the, the Syrian. This whole area of the Seleucids came from Syria. Okay, which is interesting because we were just having that big old conversation about it. And Antiochus came from Syria. But there's a fighting that's constantly going on between the Ptolemies down south and the Seleucids up north, okay? Until finally when we get to verse 20 in Daniel chapter 11, it starts to introduce Antiochus, okay? And these verses describe, again, still this power play. And look, Cleopatra was born during this time. And there was all kind of deception and, and intrigue and and people get married to try to gain power and then they would deceive one another. All of these things are going, are going on. And so ultimately, in verse, uh, he starts to stir up the king of the south to go to battle. And they, and they come to the table and they deceive one another. All right. And then they, they, and they almost end up in war. And then in verse 28, it says right here in verse 28. Uh, then he shall return to his land with great riches and his heart shall be against the holy covenant and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. So this is Antiochus Ep Epiphanes now. In other words, and, and has anybody ever heard of the word Antioch before? Y'all remember that word, Antioch? Now, this is interesting because this just hit me a little bit deeper today. Okay, what does the word Antioch mean? What happened in Antioch? Come on. That's when they first were called Christians. Thank you, Mike. Oh, I knew there was a reason why God sent you to this church. That's right. That's the place where they were first called Christians. In Antioch. See, Mike reads his Bible, man. I better not mess with that, dude. Right? Yeah, that's where they were first called Christians. Antioch of Syria. Where do you think that name came from? Antioch, Antiochus. So Antiochus was before the time frame when the church, a couple of hundred years before the church was formed. The Hellenism or the Greek culture had already influenced that whole area. Everybody was speaking Greek. The name Antioch actually shows up in about three different places in the Bible land area. So to me, I thought that that was interesting because I had never made that connection before. Antiochus Epiphanes. Antioch, the name of in Syria of the city where they were first called Jews after they were persecuted in the book of Acts. 
So it describes them going back and forth and, and, and this battle between the, the ones that are ruling in the south of <coughs> Egypt and then, and then the, these, there was actually four of them named Antiochus. And he ends up turning back towards his own land. Now, one of the things that I, if I want to show you back here is that I wish I could go over there and, and show you on the screen. But so this is his land that he's ruling all this right here. I'm just going to try to draw a big old white mark. Antiochus is and he's trying to move down here where where the where the Egyptians are. So when he comes down here to fight with them. And then when he goes back up here where he's coming from, which is up here, he, where does he have to cross through? He has to cross right through Israel. That's Israel right there, in case you didn't know. That's the, that, I know it's hard to see, but look, let me just show you. You see Jerusalem right here? Jerusalem right here in this little white, what is that? That's the Salt Sea, okay? So when he goes up from here, he has to actually go straight through Israel whenever he goes back to where he's from, which is in Syria, okay? And so... What it says right here in this particular scripture in Daniel chapter 11 verse 28 is, is that his heart shall be against the holy covenant and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. So he's against the holy covenant. He's against the, the people of Israel. Now, I thought it was interesting because I kind of did some study in history today and some of the ways that he did, it, he, he deceived them. Okay, he deceived the children of Israel. That's how the Antichrist is going to do. You know what the first thing Antiochus did? According to World Britannica Encyclopedia. The first thing that he did was he built a gymnasium right next to the temple in Jerusalem. Now, anybody that knows anything, that's where we get the Olympics from. The Grecian Olympics come from that, right? And now the thing of it is, is that in Greece, in order to enter the gymnasium, you had to go in naked because it's proved your masculinity. So in order to go into the gym, I know it's weird, but that's what they did. You had to walk up in the gym. You had to walk in public naked, and you could not enter in unless you well. So to the Jew, that was like a desecration. Like, you're not supposed to be walking around with yourself uncovered in public. As a matter of fact, the Lord said in the book of Leviticus, do not approach my altar with your underparts or your hind parts uncovered. Cover yourself. The Lord said you don't want to see all that. Okay, well, these people are over there. Uh, you know, these people are over there. They happen to, they walk around naked going into the gym. All right. And so then, so then they made it mandatory that they had to do that. But what I want you to know is they started off small. See, I want you to see that Antiochus started off small and he started changing things around him. And I got to tell you something. I don't know how long that gymnasium sat there before the Jews started doing it. But at some point in time, they started giving in and doing it. And they started becoming more like the world around them. Do you see the point that I'm trying to make? The, the point that I'm trying to make is this. Is that in the same way, when we move closer and closer to a new world order, when we move closer and closer with the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of Babel, the spirit of disobedience, whatever you want to call that spirit, it's going to continue to cause and try to, try to manipulate the people of God to become desensitized <clears throat> To the things of God and that they would begin to compromise in the air in certain areas of their life that don't seem that big of a deal after it's been around for a while. See what I'm saying? It doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal when the gymnasium now on the first day that they opened up the gymnasium and they started walking in there naked. It was a big deal. But after five years, after 10 years of seeing the same old thing, it doesn't really become that big of a deal anymore. See what I'm saying? And in society today, we're being influenced by Hollywood and the music industry. And they're telling us it's just not really that big of a deal. But that's not what the word of God says. The word of God is the standard upon which we look. And the word of God says, no, come out from amongst them and be ye separate, says the Lord. What fellowship does light have with darkness? You see, you and I, were we were bought with a price. We're not our own. We were bought with the precious blood of a lamb. Amen? Which was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. The Lord already knew that he was going to offer up Jesus. It's the word of God that we live our lives by. Now listen, i got to tell you that this is going to get harder and harder as times go forward. Yeah. It's already becoming that way. Yeah. The world, the spirit that's behind the world is against the spirit of God. Because it's the spirit of Antichrist. Amen? 
And I just want you to know that that's how he started. He started off slow, but then before you know it, it got worse. At the point in time, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter for the ships of Chittim. I want you to, I want you to see this. I tried to draw this, but you can't probably see it. You see that little island over there at the top of the Mediterranean and the little boats right there? You see the little yellow looking boats that come down? <laughs> Well, then, that, was, that was actually Rome. That island is called Cyprus. That's the first time that the Roman Empire shows up on the world stage. He goes down there to try to attack Egypt. He goes down there to try to attack Egypt, and there's a Roman officer waiting for him. They had sailed, Rome had sailed from the city of Cyprus or from the island of Cyprus and were waiting for him. And you ever heard the, the, the saying before, the line drawn in the sand? That's actually according to history when it happened. That this Roman officer came from the Roman Senate, drew a line around Antiochus, and he said, you need to tell me whether or not you will go in peace. And Antiochus said, well, I need to talk to my, to my people about it. He said, no, you're going to give me an answer before you step out of this circle. And he was forced to say that he would, that he would sign a peace treaty with Rome. And whenever he did that, he was angry. Okay, so then he goes back and he says, therefore, he shall be grieved and return. All this happened. This is all before Daniel. I guess you got to remind you, all this happened in history. And Daniel was told these things were going to happen by the angel. Okay, and it happened exactly like this. What I'm trying to tell you is in the picture that I drew for you, Cyprus is, is the name Shittim. And Rome literally was there and boats sailed from there to Egypt and met Antiochus and told him exactly what the angel told Daniel was going to happen. And Daniel wrote it down on the paper. And it's so much so that the liberal scholars don't believe that it happened. And they said that it was added later. But I'm here to tell you, you serve the God that knows the beginning from the end and all points in between. And he wanted you to know and he wanted me to know what's going to happen in the end days because he wants our eyes to be open. He doesn't want us to fall asleep, church. He doesn't want us to get drunk spiritually. The, the Apostle Paul said, those that sleep, sleep in the night. Those that be drunk are drunk in the night. Be sober. He's not, he's talking about, he's talking about spiritually be sober. Be awake. Be alert. Be sober. Your adversary, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And unfortunately, the church is drunk. Listen, it says in Revelation 17, it says that it, it, it says the inhabitants of the earth are drunk with the wine of her fornication. I'm talking about the spirit of Jezebel again. I'm talking about the spirit of Antichrist, false religion. It has entered into the world and it has caused the inhabitants of the earth to be drunk. All of this Hollywood stuff, all of this music stuff, all of this inundation and desensitizing of, 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 of the world. But guess what? They said, you know, somebody, I can hear a preacher right now. No, that, pre that verse is not for the church, sir. That church is for the world. Yeah, but the problem is the church invited the world in. Yeah. If you can't see that, then you got a problem. I'm just saying, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to say, Jesus warned, beware of the doctrine of the, the leaven of the Pharisees. Paul warned, who has bewitched you? Put a spell on you. If it was happening then, it's happening now. Yeah. It's just the spirit of Antichrist would love nothing more than to soil the bride. <laughs> Come on, somebody. That's why you got a harlot and the spirit of harlotry, the spirit of Jezebel trying to shut, like what Angie was saying, trying to shut the, the mouth of the prophets, moving and operating, and then you got the story of the bride. Jesus is coming back for the bride. The harlot wants to destroy it. The harlot wants to come between. The harlot wants to cause confusion and deception. But God's coming back for a bride. Amen? Amen. Without spot or wrinkle. Praise God. So Antiochus, uh, he, he comes back and he becomes angry. <coughs> and, he, and he comes against the Holy Covenant. And he causes, he returns with intelligence in, in them that forsake the Holy Covenant. What does he do? He shall even return and have intelligence with them or have, let's see what that word says in there. One of, one of the ideas is he will discern, he will, 
he, it basically the idea is that he, he gives to those that are going to go against the covenant, he develops fellowship. And it goes on to say that he ends up giving to them. Those that are less than, if they'll go along with him, he ends up selling properties. If you read the story, he ends up, that's what he did. Antiochus did that. He so he saw, he took from the rich. And he gave to the poor, kind of like Robin Hood, the story of Robin Hood. He took from the rich, he gave to the poor. Can I tell you that if you start slinging $100 bills around people, they just start loving you all of a sudden? Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever noticed recently with some of the things that, listen, it, I'm not trying to cause a bunch of trouble up in this church. If you want to get a shot, get a shot. If you don't want to get a shot, don't get a shot. People that get a shot love people that don't get a shot. People that don't get, love, get a shot love people that do get a shot. But what I got a problem with that, the government starts saying, I'll give you $100 if you're going to get a shot. <clears throat> Why? <laughs> you know, and then the next thing you know, they're like, well, no, you ain't going to be able to work no more if you don't get a shot. And then the next thing you know, I don't know what happens next. But that's a problem, my friend. You start, you start giving people stuff like that. I hate to say it, but I've never seen it for the last 24 years working where I work. You, you give somebody a little bit of incentive and the next thing you know, they're all in. And basically, that's what he started doing. He started giving people incentive and the next thing you know, they're turning their back on the covenant. And I've seen everybody walk into the gym naked for the last five to seven years. And now you're going to give me a little piece of property. Next thing you know, they're selling themselves out. You go ahead and scroll Facebook and look at all the Christians that called it people that call themselves Christians. And I'm not trying to judge nobody. Don't tell me I am. No. But they cannot go on there and post things that are directly oppositional to the word of God. And at the same time, it's kind of like Joel Osteen. I'm not supposed to say that, right? No, wrong. <laughs> Wrong. He gets on Larry King Live and they say, Joel, are Mormons Christians? Well, Larry, I just can't really talk about that. I don't know. Why, why can't you, Joel? Because the truth is, is that Mormons say that Jesus and Satan Lucifer are brothers. Oops. Uh -oh. <clears throat> so it ain't the same Jesus, that's for sure. Come on, somebody help me out. It is not the same Jesus that you've grown to love. It's not the same Jesus that poured his blood out for you. Right. It's not the same Jesus that's spoken of in the Bible. It ain't nowhere in this Bible. I've read it more than once where they say Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. That's right. I'm going to go off on all of them now. I just feel it come rising up in me. The Jehovah's Witness is trying to say Jesus came from the Archangel Mike. But hey, no, no, sir. Don't ever say that again in my presence. There's nowhere in the Bible that says Jesus came from the Archangel Mike. And it's just one thing after the other, and we ain't supposed to say nothing. No, I'm done with that. I'm going to say something. And, it, and you can call it what you want to, but it's love. No, you know what love? They say, oh, you ain't got no love. What are you talking about? You, it'd be easier for me to keep my mouth shut. That's not love. See, if I know what I know because the Lord led me to study that so I could talk to a Jehovah Witness, so I could talk to a Mormon. Why? Because I, maybe a little bit of it was so that I could win the debate. Okay, I'll admit it. But the bigger part of it was that I had a love for their soul. And so I studied it so that I could have a conversation with them. And now that I know it, I'm not supposed to say nothing if the door, Lord opens the door for an encounter. Now, if I don't say anything, that's not love. If I never say anything about that, that's not true love. That, that, that would mean that I just am more concerned about people liking me. See, no, Jesus said it. You know what Jesus told the religious leaders? He said, you are of your father, the devil. That's right. <laughs> Jesus said that, my friend, not me. Jesus said to the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he said, you lie. You always lie. Your father, your father is the devil and he's the father of lies. Right. And when I'm pointing, I'm not pointing. No, no. <laughs> your father's the devil and you're the father of lies. Antiochus was of his father, the devil. And he goes back over there. Listen, when he goes back out of anger, let me just tell you real quick, and I'm not going to keep you here much longer. It started off with the gymnasium. But look, after he lost in Egypt and that Roman guy drew that circle around him and said, hey, you're going to make a decision today. He was really, really mad. And he left. And that's whenever it all went down. What went down? He desecrated the temple. He made him stop circumcising. He made him stop reading the Torah. He, he put an image of himself in the holy place. Now listen, he put an image of, well, he put an image, that's not exactly true. He put an image of Zeus that kind of looked like him. So he gave honor to Zeus and he put it in the holy of holies. And he desecrated the altar by throwing a pig on it. Okay. And 
That's what you call the abomination that causes desolation. Daniel's already spoken about that in the book. The abomination where he exalts himself to be worshipped, okay? But then the abomination that causes desolation is when he puts an idol inside the temple of God itself, all right? And uh, so I also drew this other little thing that I wanted you to see here. I don't know if you can see that very well or not, but all right, cool. So I just wanted you to see some of the things that we've already covered. All right. So in five, nine, uh, these, these numbers are approximated. You know, these are a lot of these have to do with world history. I just I just Googled some numbers as far as years and to put it down here. But I wanted to show you some 597 or so 586 B.C. Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. You remember the story when we started Daniel? He besieged Jerusalem. What does that mean? He surrounded Jerusalem. He took Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were teenagers back to Babylon, right? Then in about, and listen, Daniel starts prophesying and interpreting dreams. Y'all remember that? He, 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 Nebuchadnezzar's son, which was Belshazzar, I'm pretty sure that was his name. He, he's over there having a party. Remember that? We already studied it. And they were drinking. They said, hey, go get those articles out of the, that my daddy brought back from Jerusalem. Let's drink some wine out of that stuff. And so they over there, they having their party. And all of a sudden, that hand shows up. Y'all remember that story? Writing on the rock wall. Many, many tekel of harshin. And, and he doesn't know what it means. And so they, oh, Daniel will tell you what it means. And so they go get Daniel. And he's like, he said, you've been, you've been weighed in the balances. And you've been found wanting. And this very night, your kingdom will be taken from you. And according to, and that night, the Persians, the Medo-Persians overwhelmed and overtook Babylon. And so right there, whenever this is happening, Daniel's over here prophesying that it's going to happen. Then he begins to prophesy about Greece with the horns and all of that kind of stuff. That happens about 331 BC. And then about 167 BC is this Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes which does the abomination that causes desolation when he puts the image of Zeus into the temple. Okay, Rome starts about 136 BC, and we all know, we should remember, that Rome was the empire in charge when Jesus was born. Amen? Y'all remember that? All right. Now, I want, to, I, want you to, I want us to focus on this a little bit for a second. Now, so look, here we got this time frame between the Medo-Persians, and, and, and Antiochus, all right? But look, right here, Ezra and Nehemiah, that's some two books in the Bible. Y'all read Ezra and Nehemiah yet? I've already taught it to you at least once. We're gonna teach it again. But Ezra and Nehemiah occurred during the time frame whenever the Persian kings release the Jews to go back and what? Rebuild the city, rebuild the altar, rebuild the wall, okay? To prepare the city so that they can go back, right? And that takes place about 400 and. 50 uh, BC. But what I want you to see is, is that Antiochus Epiphanes, and I mentioned this to y'all about three weeks ago, when he put, causes this desecration on the altar, and he when he puts this image inside, this is what causes the Maccabean revolt. Have y'all ever heard of the Maccabean revolt? See, this is, to me, I love this stuff because I'm learning this stuff better every year that I teach the Bible. All right, and, and what I want you to know is I always knew that there was a Maccabean revol revolt and I kind of knew the story a little bit, but I understand it so much better today than I did even four weeks ago. All right. So whenever Antiochus causes all this trouble, not everybody wants to bow their knee to this garbage. You understand? As a matter of fact, if we went back to the Daniel 11 later on, it says that those that are strong in the Lord will do great exploits. And that's exactly what the Maccabees did. There was a man named Mattathias. He was connected to the high priest. His name was Mattathias Maccabee. And the word Maccabee literally means a hammer. And the story goes that, that Antiochus, uh, an official of Antiochus, went to, Mac, to, the, to Mattathias and said, you're going to have to offer up a sacrifice because he was the high priest. And he said, I ain't going to offer up no sacrifice to no false god. Not going to do it. And another priest stood in the way and said, I'll do it. And what happened was Mattathias murdered or killed, they, they use strong language, killed, defended the covenant, if you will, that officer that Antiochus had sent. That caused the whole Maccabean revolt. Okay, this was a very small army against a big old army. 
And they were hiding up in the Judean hills and they were fighting them. This went on during what's called the silent years of the Bible. And that's why I put the time frame of Ezra and Nehemiah 450 BC. And then this time frame is where we get Hanukkah. Now, now you know, this is kind of interesting. I didn't plan on talking about Santa Claus tonight. But it's just weird to me that, that look at this, the, under Ma the Maccabean revolt, Hanukkah, that, the that this dude threw that pig on the altar on December the 25th or the 25th of Kislev, which is the Israel's version of December. Now, I, I, I see Hannah over there. Like, she's like, huh? <laughs> yeah. See, she'll be, she already knows what she's thinking. That's what I'm thinking. It's like, where did this date come from to begin with? But anyway, yep. now the Jews celebrate Hanukkah in remembrance of when they rededicated the temple. So, again... If we look at Ezra and Nehemiah, the Persian kings released them to go back build the city, to rebuild the altar. Then moving forward in history, all of a sudden this Antiochus guy shows up after the temple's rebuilt, after they're living in the, in the city again, after they've reinstituted the sacrifices. And then he comes in and he demands they stop the sacrifice. He puts the image of Zeus in there. He throws the pig on it. It took them three years to get rid of all the articles of idolatry and to cleanse the temple again. Three years it took them to do that. And, and then once the temple was rededicated, they started this festival or this feast known as Hanukkah, also known as the Feast of Dedication. All right? The Feast of Dedication. Let's go look at that real quick. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 22. The Feast of Dedication. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. There you go. The Bible tells us that Jesus attended the feast of dedication. Jesus attended Hanukkah. Okay? And I want you to think about this. Because if Jesus attended Hanukkah, that means that he understood what Hanukkah represented. That means he understood what happened in 167 BC. That means he understood this person Antiochus Epiphanes had desecrated the altar. It means he understood that Antiochus Epiphanes had put an image of Zeus inside of the temple. And then he says later on, whenever his disciples ask him about the end of the age, this is what he says. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Now let's slow this down. Let's, let's see what he's saying here. When you, he, they want to know the end. When you see. Now, look, some people would say, yeah, but he's talking to his disciples. I'm not trying to talk about when the rapture is taking place. I'm trying to make a point. Jesus is saying, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So is Jesus saying, when Daniel the prophet spoke of the abomination of desolation, he was talking about Antiochus epiphanies and that he what he did but what jesus is doing like 200 years later is he's saying when you see that in other words what, what this means is this is what you call the dual law of prophecy what that means is an immediate or a near fulfillment of the prophecy and also an eventual fulfillment of the prophecy ain't nobody that you can trust better than jesus my friend and Jesus said it's going to happen again. Jesus says it's going to happen again. And for whoever's here, when you see the abomination that causes desolation that was spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. That means that the Antichrist is going to do what Antiochus did. But he's going to even take it further because it says in the end verses of Daniel 11 that he's going to magnify himself above all God. All right. And he says, whoso reads, let him understand. I'm going to close with this last one because this is the Apostle Paul telling us. And I know we've already covered some of these scriptures already, but I hope that they at least help you to uh, be able to put it together now that we've talked about it a few different times. Now, now we're talking about, look at this. He says, that day will not come except there comes a falling away first and the man of sin. That's talking about the Antichrist is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, 
showing himself that he is God. So there you go. We got two passages of scripture in the New Testament that tell us that the abomination that causes desolation is also it's a past event, but it's also a future event. And in the future, what's going to happen is the Antichrist. Is there's going to be a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. All right. There's going to be a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And real quick, I'm going to say this. I know I'm, I've said it quick, but what we talked about the 70 weeks of Daniel. Y'all remember that? Do y'all remember what started the last week? The time clock? The signing of the, the, signing of the covenant. covenant. When that covenant is signed, it starts the last seven year period talked about in Daniel's 70th week. And in the middle of that, he's going to break it according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. He's going to break it. And the way he's going to break it is the abomination that causes desolation. He's going to stop the sacrifices that will be reinstituted. He's going to exalt himself in the temple of God. And he's going to demand to be worshipped as though he were God. And that's what's going to break the covenant. And that's what's going to start the last three and a half years of the last seven years. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, Lord. We know that you have prepared us, Lord. You have given us your word. Sometimes it's not that easy to find the answers, Lord, but your word says in the Proverbs that the heart of the king seeks out a treasure, Lord God, and your word is certainly a treasure. And so we pray, your word says in Revelation 5 that you have made us kings and priests unto our God, Lord, so you have given us the title of royalty, Lord. I pray that you would give us the desire that kings should have to seek out the matter, to dig and to search, Lord God, in your word, Lord, that we would learn your truth, oh Lord God, not the words of a man, but the words of the living God. We pray that you, Holy Spirit, would help us to be able to discern truth, oh Lord God. We need your help, Lord God, because on our own, we will be led astray, Lord. Don't let us be led astray. We pray that your sweet spirit will lead and guide us in all truth, Lord, that we would hear your voice, Lord, that you would open up the word of God to us and that we would understand your ways and your will. Lord God, I pray for the people that were here tonight, those that might watch on video, Lord, that you would minister to each and every one of them, Lord. We thank you for your healing power. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're a God that heals, oh Lord God. We look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, and we pray that you would have your way with us.